Thank you, Conrad. Are we, yeah, we're working. Okay, this has been, I, it, both days now, I, I, you know, have to take off my very carefully selected jewels to accommodate all the mics. Uh, I'm wearing my outdoor coat. Uh, it was a little chilly in here, but I also need it to, because I have things, packs on each side. So uh, it's, it's been interesting. Um, look, before I get into, begin my remarks, just a couple of administrative things. Uh, my phone is here because I have this ongoing problem with the army vis-a-vis -vis my daughter. Uh, it's administrative. It's driving us crazy. I actually finally today got a live person at the main recruitment base to answer, and they're going to call me back. And I'm really sorry, but if they call while I'm speaking, I'm going to take two minutes and talk. I have to. This is like the doctor, the school principal, everybody calling combined, because it's not really easy to get them back on the line. So that's number one. Number two is I just wanted to say how much I've enjoyed the last couple of days. Um, what an amazing group of people. I think that the diversity in age is, it's, it's great, uh, but I'm so blown away by how engaged you are and the good work you do. And I've you know, had an opportunity and really tried to get around to speak with as many people as possible, and hopefully after this session, um, I'll get to speak to a few others. But. Um, I've said this many, many times over the last couple of days, but this is really, you know, little Norway, and being Canadian, that's not condescending, I can say that. Uh, little Norway punching way above its weight. Um, I, I don't think there are many groups like this in Europe, uh, so good for you. Um, and if in the future I can be of any help, uh, Conrad knows where to find me, so do a few others, don't hesitate to reach out. I'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, just remind me where I met you, <laughs> OK? Um, so I, I'm also very grateful to Conrad because you know, first when he approached me and asked me if I would speak, uh, and it was George Deke, I think, who was the connector between the two of us, who many of you probably remember from his days as the deputy uh, ambassador, Israeli ambassador in Oslo, and the fabulous speech he gave here a few years ago. Um, George is also a personal friend of mine. Um, and. I just have tremendous respect for him. And also his family, the Deke family, you know, they're a big family in Jaffa. They're a really important family. And it so happens before I knew George, um, his uncle and cousin are also my insurance brokers <laughs> because they came very highly recommended. But they're a strong, they're a lovely family, and they're a very proud family. Um, and they are a very supportive uh, in, they're an Arab family that understands the Middle East, that understands Israel, and is very happy to be living there. Very happy. Conrad, uh, you know, he approached me and he said, well, we'd like you to come and speak. And I said, okay, so, uh, like, about what? Uh, and he came up with two fabulous topics, I think. Um, and what he's asked me to uh, address today is Israel's strategic role in the era of Trump in the Middle East. Um, which is so fabulous because it's like such a lob, you know, in tennis, right? It's great. I can do what I want with it. But it is actually a serious topic, too. And, you know, again, bottom line is how I started speaking yesterday, and I'm going to begin again today. Uh, is, bottom line is I don't really think it actually makes a whole lot of difference. Now, I, I realize that's a very kind of bold, superficial comment, but... You know, they come and go. The faces change. Sometimes the nature of the statements change. But Israel's strategic role in the Middle East, and frankly, I think in the world by extension, seems to remain the same no matter who's in power. And there are two aspects, two primary aspects to it, in my view. One is that Israel is and always has been the bulwark, the bulwark kind of holding back extremism from spreading into Europe and elsewhere possibly more quickly and more aggressively. And it's not just as simple as being a physical barrier, because we all know it's a tiny little sand spit. But there's a metaphorical value, too. There's a level of attention that by being there, Israel draws. And you know, then there flows political discussion and other uh, consequences. But that, the main strategic value for Israel is to be there for the world, 
to constantly criticize it. <laughs> and there's tremendous value in that for the world, not so much for Israel. Um, you know, I was watching on uh, social media in the last few days, it was uh, Vladimir Putin. And I thought he made the point that I'm trying to make now very, very well. It was Putin speaking at a conference. I don't know what the conference was. It doesn't matter. But you'll understand. I mean, I got enough of the vibe once I watched this little video of him telling this joke. Um, he says, you want to hear a joke? A joke about the Israeli army? Sure, who doesn't want to hear a joke in the middle of a boring panel at a conference? So you have a general in the army, and he's got a young soldier, and he says, if you see 20 terrorists coming at you, what are you going to do? And the kid says, I'm going to get my Uzi, my gun, and I'm going to shoot them. OK. And what are you going to do if a tank starts coming at you? He says, I'm going to get my you know, rocket propelled launcher, I think that's what you call them, isn't it? The ones you hoist on your shoulder. And I'm going to aim it at the tank, and I'm going to neutralize it. OK, good answer. OK, so what, what do you do then if you see the terrorists and the tank and warplanes at the same time? The kid says, General, am I the only one in this army? <laughs> and Putin said, am I the only one in this panel? And I ask, is Israel the only country in the world? You know, you look at this obsessive, toxic fixation that almost every country has, even those that think they're well-meaning. International organizations, NGOs, I'm telling you stuff you already know, but this is the world we live in, and this is Israel's role in it, for all kinds of reasons I think that were discussed more yesterday. And at the end of the day, I don't think that who's in power, whether it be Trump or Obama, hugely impacts the role that Israel plays in this global mix, in this global equation. It's nice, it's nice to have a bit of a reprieve from Obama, I'll get to him in a moment, but it hasn't really fundamentally changed. I think it may be starting to, but it has not yet changed how Israel is viewed in the international community. Before I get to Obama, though, and, and Trump, and the main points that I'm going to make, I have to uh, pick up on some of the comments that two of you was making this morning about language. And, you know, he made the comment that to really understand a culture, you have to understand the language. And I, I not near the linguist that he is, but having spoken a few, and speaking a few now, um, I, I've always felt that way. I totally agree. And I'm going to just share a I, what I think is a telling anecdote with you. When I arrived in Israel uh, as ambassador in 2014, I decided I was going to work aggressively on improving my Hebrew, which was, well, I thought I spoke Hebrew at the time. My Israeli friends now tell me, Viv, you thought you spoke Hebrew? Now you speak Hebrew. Um, it's four years later. Uh, but I also really, really wanted to learn Arabic. Um, and I set to it, I mean, it's very time consuming to be the ambassador and to work on two languages. But I did work hard on my Arabic until the war, and I just couldn't. I just had no time. But it was so fascinating. You know, my Arabic teacher, who was Iraqi uh, by birth, she said to me, we're basically going to spend the first six months learning greetings. Because the first half hour of any conversation in Arabic is this back and forth of, oh, and you know, bless you, and bless you, and your family, and there's this cycle of greetings and blessings and that goes on and on and on, um, and sort of feeds on itself. And it's a cultural thing. Hebrew is very different. Uh, one of the things I've learned is that uh, there's no word in Hebrew for nuance. There are close translations, but there is no Hebrew word for nuance. And that kind of tells you all you need to know. <laughs> Hebrew, as we were discussing over lunch, it's a language of tachlis. Tachlis is bottom line. 
We don't spend half an hour greeting and complimenting one another. We get right down to it, whether it be an insult or a compliment or whatever it is. What we want, we put it on the table. And that's a very important aspect of the, the culture. And it's also a very important aspect, I think, of what I'm talking about. Because what's the tachlis? It would be really nice to believe that things are going to change fundamentally in the region. They'll change around the margins. They won't change fundamentally. When I was ambassador, there is this uh, multilateral force. The Norwegian troops, I believe, are in there. A lot of Canadian troops. It's the force that was constituted in 1981-82 uh, by the international community, but of course kind of basically owned by the U.S., uh, it's always led by, uh, like, the civilian leader is a U.S. leader, and its mandate is to keep peace in the Sinai Desert between Egypt and Israel. Um, and I, because we had a Canadian general running it for a few years, and we had a lot of Canadian troops, I would often go and visit. And I once had a very senior bureaucrat, very senior, from the Canadian uh, government come to visit. And he was so Canadian which is a kind of euphemism for naive. And uh, he was like, you know, 30 years, over 30 years, like by now, they have peace. And we met with very senior Israeli officials, very senior. Um, I had words with him. And nothing we could tell him, he would not believe anything we could tell him. Didn't matter how much evidence, how much proof, how could, didn't, because he blocked it out, because we were Jews, because we were Israel, because there were a million reasons why he wasn't going to trust what we said. So then we went to meet with the head of the multilateral force, who sat down with this guy in a briefing. And he asked his question, and he was a little smug about it, and this guy just blasted him. I have to, I have to admit, I enjoyed the moment immensely. And he said to him, like, basically, are you crazy? The Egyptians hate the Israelis. And they always will. They cooperate because they have to for strategic reasons. But make no mistake, if they didn't need the Israelis, they wouldn't be doing anything with them on a political or a military level. And so that brings us to the Trump era and have things really changed. And I don't think you can really talk about Trump without talking about Obama. Because whatever we want to think or say about Trump, I think he's a reaction to Obama. Obama made him possible. And I think we all remember too, all too clearly the red line weekend. It happened to be the weekend of my birthday and I was in Israel. Uh, it was August 2013, the end of August when Obama said, if you use chemical weapons, watch out. Um, I arrived as a tourist that August uh, to spend a few days in Israel. Uh, the Canadian embassy evacuated all of their staff to Cyprus. I arrived. And I remember walking through the market, the craft market in Tel Aviv, and people saying to me, like, so what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I'm like, I don't know. Like, what do I know? Um, they were worried, and they weren't worried. The red line threat passed, and we all know what happened. And that, in many ways, was the beginning of the end. And that, I think, was a real turning point that allowed someone like Trump to become the president of the United States. Because what we saw then and what we saw in the, in the following years was that Obama was completely oblivious to the culture, the mentality, of the Middle East. As many people in the political diplomatic community with which I interact a fair bit, uh, and they're not all right-wingers, uh, but many people took to calling Obama a South Side community organizer, which is a little disparaging for the President of the United States, because that's how he approached things. There's been lots that's been written about this. Jeffrey Goldberg wrote an important piece in The Atlantic. It was called The Obama Doctrine. Um, but the bottom line is, Obama decided, and this was clear, Obama decided, and I've had this also told to me by 
high-ranking State Department officials. The Iranians were predictable. They were rational in his, the way he looked at them, because they were predictable. You could look at their behavior, you could look at a set of circumstances, and you could predict what they would do and say. So, okay, that's not how I look at it, that's how he looks at it. Predictable, rational, linear, very smart, and Mr. Southside Chicago decided we're going to get farther if we can actually talk to them and convince them and show them respect finally. Let's treat them with respect because they've, why, why? So this is what happens and they go to have this negotiation and he comes out with his fabulous deal which I've always referred to as a capitulation. Never understood any of it. But what I really don't understand, and this is coming full circle to Trump now, is why nothing was linked. Okay, you want to go and try to negotiate with these guys. By the way, Obama, you got fleeced in the bazaar. Fleeced. Why was this so-called deal not linked to sanctions? Okay, if you comply, you know, we'll, we'll do this in a kind of accretive way as you meet certain milestones, then we'll consider lifting certain sanctions. No, nope, they lifted all the sanctions right away. Well, that's a great negotiating tactic. Just throw away all your leverage. Why was the deal not tied to a cessation of Iran's interballistic missile program? Nothing. You can keep doing whatever you want. Why was the deal not tied to some form of control over Iran's very well-known funding, financing of international terrorism. Because Obama actually didn't really care. And Obama's view of the world, and Obama's view more importantly of the Middle East, was that there's nothing really special about Israel. He wasn't buying the Israel special rule. He wasn't buying there's anything particularly distinctive or important about Israel in the Middle East. And he demonstrated that by his policy. Amen. Very, very clearly. The one good thing about Obama is that he forced the Sunnis to start to cooperate and create this block, for what it's worth, with Israel, which is a significant kind of realignment uh, of, glo of the Middle East power and Middle East politics. But I see it as a fleeting one. I mean, I, I don't think it's going to be like that in 100 years. And I'm not a pessimist. I think I'm a realist. Um, you know, after 2,000 years of having our behinds kicked, we're start, I mean, some of us are starting to finally pay attention to it and take people like, you know, the Iranians seriously. And all of this led to this Trump moment. And the Trump moment, I, you know, many of you in the room, like me, probably remember the movie Network. It was in the late 70s. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Do you remember that movie about the news media? That's Trump. I mean, he just hit, he, he hit a visceral thing. He hit a nerve among a lot of Americans who clearly felt marginalized and not represented by Obama or by Hillary Clinton. He, 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 he appealed to people whose kids were going to fight in wars, who went to Iraq, who lived with this day to day. He appealed to people who actually don't think having transgendered bathrooms in rural Kentucky is a number one priority. There are other things we should get to, like job creation. He gave a voice to these marginalized people. I just don't know, other than anger and frustration, how much sort of, of a consolidated voice or constituency these people are. I, I don't know. It's not saying they aren't or they are. It's saying I simply don't know. What impact does this have on Israel? Nobody really knows. One thing we do know clearly is that Trump hates the Iran deal. Okay? He says it at every opportunity and it's, it, you know, the big story now that he might not, de he might decertify it. Nobody's actually even really sure what that means and what effect that may have on anything. Federica Mogherini, the, uh, from the EU, like our new Catherine Ashton, I saw something on the news, I think it was yesterday or the day before, some comments she made, and she said, 
She, be, she looks very glum, and she usually looks quite cheerful, nice. Uh, she was very glum and very serious, and she uh, repeated over and over that this isn't actually an American deal. This is a multilateral thing. It's not about one country. So, you know, she didn't say, Donald, whatever you do, you know, we don't care. I, I think everyone's playing this game. Everyone's using words. Nobody really understands what the effect of certain actions will be. But what we do know is that Trump doesn't like the deal, and he's threatening to back out of it. And what does all of that mean? Even in Israel, the politicians, you know, everyone hates Iran. Everyone's terrified of what Iran, what an Iran with a nuclear capability may mean for Israel, because in Israel we tend to take them seriously, that they really will nuke us. It's not a kind of academic exercise like it is for Obama. What will it all come to? Nobody knows. This is such a defining moment, and I think that in the America-US equation, is if Israel is to have any strategic, so in the America Iran equation, sorry, if Israel is to have any strategic value, it has to have influence. And the truth is, it's unclear that Israel has any influence on the Trump White House. Nobody even really knows who's running policy, foreign policy, and in particular, Mid East policy in the Trump White House. Is it Jared? Is it Ivanka? Is it Jason Greenblatt? Is it Donald? It's sure not Tillerson in the State Department. That much we do know. And it's really diffuse. So if you're to have any kind of strategic impact or value, you have to have somebody you can pick up the phone and call and influence. And that's not really clearly the case between Israel and the Trump White House. There are open lines of communication. There's lots of back and forth. But the, when it comes down to tachlis, to the bottom line, it's unclear. And that, I think, is the world we live in. I think that, you know, I often look back in history and I think, what would it have been like to have lived? And, you know, in the immediate, uh, you know, the, the months immediately preceding the outbreak of World War I, there were a lot of things going on. But I bet you nobody would have foretold or foreseen that the murder of the Duke would have kicked off World War I. There were many other things that were far more pressing, and it's that, that final, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back, it's the match in the haystack. I, 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 one thing that I will be bold enough stupidly to predict is I don't think the next big world conflagration, and it's not that far off, it's not going to start in Israel. But you've got so much going on and you've got so much uncertainty between, with the Trump factor, with North Korea, with Iran, um, that I think, much as I'd like to think differently, that Israel's strategic value in this era is sadly what it's always been. We're there to get pounded, beaten up internationally, criticized, um, and take whatever people want to throw at us. That hasn't changed. And I want to just close with one uh, comment, because it, as I was speaking, it just popped into my head, and I think it's quite relevant. Because very often, living in Israel is surreal. Um, it's just the way things unfold and do not is not logical. It's not linear, you know, to Tuvia's point this morning. It's the Middle East. It's completely counterintuitive to what you might expect. So back to it was July 2014 when I was the ambassador and I, I went home for three weeks. I had sold my house. I wanted to pack it up, see my friends and family. And I went back and I was home for two or three days and then the war broke out. Um, meaning that Israel finally put boots on the ground. Now, just to remind you, you probably don't need the reminding, but for two weeks before Israel put boots on the ground, 
there were, as I mentioned yesterday, about 150 missiles a day being shot from Gaza into Israel and, you know, as close to civilian areas as they could aim. And I remember Bibi imploring the global community to please put pressure on Hamas. Please get them to stop because we don't want to go in. But we're not going to keep taking this pounding. Yeah, whatever. Nobody did anything. Until the day Israel went in and put boots on the ground. And then all of a sudden the world's coming to an end, right? War crimes, apartheid, you know, genocide, all that stuff. And everybody's going crazy. So two days into this, you know, international condemnation-a-thon of Israel, I landed and I went straight from the airport to a press conference that was being held by Avigdor Lieberman, who was at the time the Minister of Foreign Affairs, now Minister of Defense. And it was very unusual, this press conference, for a whole bunch of reasons. It was for the diplomats. Um, and he did his thing to try to explain, which we're always trying to do, why we went in. Why Israel went in at that time. And from the second I landed, I have this app on my phone that all Israelis have. It's the red alert rocket alarm. So every time a rocket comes in, you get this alarm, right? And it was just amazing. Like I landed and my phone just didn't stop. It just didn't stop. And I'm sitting in this press conference and it's going on and on and on. I thought this, it was just surreal. Like the contrast, you know, I'm sitting here with all these like suited and tied diplomats and we're listening to the minister and like rockets are flying. And they are questioning why Israel is defending it. It was just surreal. And so I started tweeting. Oh, another one coming, another one coming, another one coming. And my fabulous CBC journalist who was stationed in Israel tweeted a snarky little comment about, well, look at the ambassador, live tweeting. I thought, really? You something expletive. Really? The story is that the ambassador is live tweeting. No, the story is, you know what the story is. And what the ambassador was trying to do was to convey to people in Canada to try, clearly I didn't succeed, what this means when people are shooting rockets. Like, it's real. Everyone's willing to suspend disbelief. Everyone's willing to suspend disbelief when it's Israel. That, to me, was a real wake-up moment. It was a real wake-up moment, a disturbing one. Um, but that is the reality of Israel in the Middle East. That's the reality of Israel in the world. And I think leaders like Trump, who seem to align whatever his policy may actually be, who seem to align more with Israel's interests, at the end of the day, it kind of like, it all evens out. It all, we have better ones, we have worse ones, we have better days, we have worse days. I actually think in many ways, the more Trump seems to support Israel, the worse it is for Israel, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and I think at this point, I'm going to stop um, muddying the waters even further than they already were and welcome any comments, questions, suggestions, and thank you for your attention.